let's take a look at the first question in this passage, and that's the CD spec signal that was used to generate the data in figure one arises from the chirality of blank. So this uh, CD spec um, depends on the fact that amino acids are chiral. Um, well, almost all of them. And so let's draw an example amino acid here. Okay, so this is the, the foundation for almost all of your amino acids, right? You have your carbon with the R group attached, you have the carboxyl group attached, and you have the amine group attached here. Now, if you take a look at this carbon, you'll notice it's chiral. Why is that there's four different substituents attached to it? The first substituent is your R group, then you have a carboxyl group attached, and you have an amine group attached, and the fourth one, which is not drawn, is the hydrogen in the back here. Um, but I'll remove that. So what that means is four different groups attached to this carbon. This carbon is the chiral center. This is what the, the chirality of amino acids arises from. Now, there's one exception to this, and that's glycine. Um, you should know by now that glycine is drawn like this. And that's because it has two hydrogens. Its R group is actually a hydrogen, meaning there's not four unique groups attached to this carbon, meaning this is a chiral. This is not a chiral amino acid. But for the rest of the 19 amino acids, this carbon right here, this R group is unique and therefore has four unique groups attached to this carbon, meaning this carbon is a chiral center and this amino acid is chiral. Um, so since 19, almost all of the amino acids have this chirality, the fact that CD spec relies on chirality means it's actually relying on the fact that this carbon right here is chiral. So next makes the answer choice, the alpha carbon. This right here is the alpha carbon. Now the second, the, the answer choice B says amide nitrogen. Well, what is the amide nitrogen? This is the amine nitrogen they're talking about, but let's briefly uh, draw a peptide bond here. <clears throat> All right, so let's say it's connected to some random things here, but this is what a peptide bond looks like, right? So you have the first amino acid connected on this side, the second amino acid connected on this side. You have a lone pair and you have a hydrogen. Now you're looking at this and saying, okay, it looks like nitrogen is attached to four unique things, right? And you'd be correct in thinking, okay, this might be a chiral, chiral center. The problem is that Nitrogen um, kind of goes through this flipping. It's this uh, interconversion kind of, where it inverts itself super fast. So if I were to draw this in a 3D manner, let's say it's attached to one amino acid here, attached to hydrogen up front, and it's attached to another amino acid back here. This actually flips super rapidly where this kind of folds uh, upwards and the lone pair comes down here and so then what happens is then you have something like this. Everything flips upwards. <clears throat> okay, and so this flips rapidly, interconverts super fast in between each other. Um, and what happens is then it's really difficult to determine what the chirality is, making the amide nitrogen not the chiral center that you're looking for for this question because of this super rapid interconversion where you can't really tell if it's in the R or the S configuration. <clears throat> The carbonyl carbon, um, that's this carbon right here that they're talking about. Like I said, the carbonyl, uh, the carbon for it to be a chiral center has to be attached to four unique groups. You notice this carbon right here, it's only attached to one oxygen, one hydroxyl group, and the rest of this amino acid, that's only three unique groups, even though it has four different bond, or four bonds. Um, again, it has to be the number of groups, not the number of bonds, and so it's only attached to three different groups, even though it has four bonds, and making it, it can't, making it that it can't be the chiral center. Again, chiral center, attachment to four unique groups. So C is wrong. Now beta carbon. Now this is where the exception for D comes in. Um, <clears throat> now we know that 19 out of the 20 carbons or amino acids, sorry, have this chiral center, this alpha carbon, making it such that almost all of these uh, peptides rely on this fact right here, that this alpha carbon is chiral. Now some of you guys might be thinking, okay, what is the beta carbon? And, and uh, isn't it possible that the beta carbon could be chiral? And you're right. Let's take a look at one of these examples. All right, let's take a look at isoleucine. All right. Now, in this case, the beta carbon does have chirality. And why is that? You have the alpha carbon here. And the beta carbon is actually the next carbon that's attached. And that's right here. And in this beta carbon, yes, there is chirality, right? This beta carbon is attached to one group here, another group here, and there's a hydrogen that's not shown, but it's attached to the hydrogen, and it's attached to the rest of this amino acid here. So that's four unique groups, making the beta carbon here chiral. But how many amino acids um, does the beta carbon apply to where there's chirality? I believe it's something like two. So two out of 20 is where the, you have beta carbon chirality which means for the amino acids or for the peptide chains that, that, don't, that don't contain 
this amino acid, um, chirality is going to depend on something else, and that's going to be the alpha carbon. The overwhelming majority of the amino acids in these peptide chains, their chirality depends on this alpha carbon, not the beta carbon, since most do not have beta carbon chirality. That's why we don't rely on the beta carbon, but rather the alpha carbon for the chirality for CD spec. <clears throat> All right, let's move on to the next question. Which physical property does not change with the amino acid substitution made in TPMT5? All right, so what's the amino acid substitution made in TPMT5? We have leucine to serine, all right? Leucine to serine. Specifically, the leucine in the 49th position is going to be changed to serine. So what changes? Well, we should know what the structures of leucine and serine are. Um, molecular weight, you know, without having to exactly... Look about uh, look at what the molecular weights of leucine and serine are. We can probably assume that since these are two different amino acids, they're going to be different. But um, let's keep in the back of the mind that this might not be true. We might add up the actual side chains here, and turns out maybe they have the exact same molecular weight. But let's, so let's not rule out A quite yet. Hydrophobicity. All right, so does this change? Leucine, a hydrocarbon, pure hydrocarbon, right? And serine, this has an OH group attached, okay? So... We know that this is going to be much more hydrophilic than a leucine, which is just purely hydrocarbons. So yes, hydrophobicity does change, therefore this has to be wrong. Same, same idea with hydrogen bond capability, right? This one has OH, this one is just pure hydrocarbons. Therefore the OH, much better at hydrogen bonding. Therefore you do change hydrogen bonding capabilities. Therefore C is wrong. Now net charge. Let's look at the difference between net charge between leucine and serine. All right, the side chains um, are going to be what differentiates if there's any change in net charge. The side chain uh, net charge for leucine, that's zero, right? Purely hydrocarbons, nothing deprotonating or protonating. Serine is also going to be zero. So even though it has this alcohol group, this hydrogen doesn't really want to fall off too easily. Um, I believe the pKa is actually above 12 for this serine in order for you. Uh, so that means you have to have a pH above 12 to deprotonate this hydrogen. So, you know, at most pHs, you're not going to be deprotonating this hydrogen. Therefore, this is also going to have a net charge of zero. So net charge is the only thing that doesn't change. Um, we could go back and look at the molecular weights of the leucine side chains or the side chains of serine, make sure that they do change. But if you are running short on time, it's completely okay to just um, definitively know that D has to be the correct answer. And um, that way you don't have to double check answer choice A. However, if you do have the time, I always recommend double checking answers. Let's take a look at the next question here. Samples from various time points of proteolysis of TPMT wild type were subjected to SDS pH under reducing conditions, which figure depicts the ex expected appearance of the SDS gel, or of the gel. And, you know, the arrow indicates the movement of the protein through the gel. All right, what is SDS pH? Um, this is a denaturing, okay, a denaturing type of um, gel electrophoresis. All right, SDS, this is a denaturing agent. What that means, it's going to unfold the protein. And not only that, you're doing this under reducing conditions, which means you're actually breaking up any disulfide bonds that exist um, between these... Uh, between these amino acids, or sorry, between the protein chains or peptide chains, or within the peptide, peptide chains themselves. All right, let's take a look. Which figure best depicts the expected appearance of the gel? Well, if you don't use any SD, uh, reducing conditions, or, um, or actually, maybe we should go back to the passage here. All right, it says the proteins incubated with chymotrypsin, and then which you know cleaves up the proteins, and then the lengths of times were ranging from zero to two hundred minutes, which means from zero minutes you're not actually applying any enzyme which means that at zero minutes, you should have a completely intact protein, okay? Now, what do we know about SDS page? We know that, you know, the smaller fragments go down further, okay? That's the, the smaller protein fragments will go down further. They will travel further. What does that mean? At zero minutes, when the protein is just fully intact, you should actually see the protein up here, not down here. Why? When it's fully intact, it's not going to want to move through the gel as much. You know, it's big, it's bulky, it's going to get caught in caught up in the gel, it's not going to want to move very far. So at the zero minute mark, or at the zero minutes where um, there's no um, application of the chymotrypsin, in other words, there's nothing that's cutting up the protein, what you be seeing, what you should be seeing at most is that you should be seeing um, the fully intact protein up here where, the, where it hasn't moved much. So we can immediately rule out A and B. Now let's look at the difference between C and D. We notice that if we incubate the proteins longer, okay, we'll see these uh, many different bands, right? These different bands are the parts of the proteins that have become undone and they're migrating through the gel a lot further. Now, what's the difference between C and D? We look at D and we see that there's a decreasing amount, okay? So band intensity, the thickness of these bands shows you how much protein there is in that specific region of the, of the gel. 
And we see that when we incubate these proteins longer with that enzyme chymotrypsin, which again, cuts these proteins up, the longer we incubate it, D is telling us, hey, we're not gonna have as many full-size proteins, and rather these proteins are gonna be down here. They're gonna be cut up, they're gonna be migrating down the gel. On the other hand, C is telling us, hey, it doesn't matter, you know, even at five minutes, at 50 minutes, 200 minutes, where we incubate with chymotrypsin, even if we incubate, you know, these proteins with, at 200 minutes, uh, with, or with chymotrypsin for 200 minutes, you're still gonna have a lot uh, of the original fully intact protein, but that's just not realistic, okay? Uh, one thing about this gel is that it makes sense, you know? Um, the longer you incubate these proteins with this enzyme that cleaves, that cuts up the protein, you're gonna have less of the fully intact protein, okay? Time point zero, this is what the fully intact protein is supposed to be at. And as you incubate these proteins longer and longer and longer with this protein cutting enzyme, you're not gonna have as much of the full-length protein um, until, well, you don't have any of the full-length protein at all. And in fact, you know, when you look at the 200-minute mark, you're looking down here and you're seeing, okay, all we see are these cut-up bits. There's no more fully intact protein. Okay, that's what differentiates between C and D, and that's what makes D the correct answer. Again, to reiterate, at 200 minutes when you're incubating um, this protein with uh, the, the TPMT protein with chymotrypsin, at 200 minutes, you're not gonna have a lot of the, the full length, if any, of the full length protein here. In zero minutes, it makes sense to have the full length protein, okay, because you haven't applied this protein cutting enzyme. However, at 200 minutes, you know, you're, you're basically gonna wanna see something that's, or wanna see that there's none, none of the original full length protein left at all. And of course, as you incubate longer and longer from zero minutes to 200 minutes, you're gonna be seeing less and less of that. That's what makes D the correct answer here. Final question of this passage, and it says, if the combined mass of the TPMT substrate and cofactor was determined before the enzymatically catalyzed reaction, and then compared to the combined mass of the product and the cofactor after the reaction, the net change in molecular weight will be blank. Now, I will say this is a pretty difficult question. Um, it requires you to think about this a little bit more in depth, but let's think about this carefully and let's think about it slowly, okay? The TPMT substrate, so the thing that the, the enzyme TPMT will be modifying. Okay, let's say this is a substrate, S for substrate. Now, see, so you have a cofactor here. This is the cofactor here. Now, this is before the reaction, and something happens, and then what you're going to do is look, you're going to look at the mass of the substrate that's changed in the cofactor after the reaction. So let's say this is the reaction, okay? Now, it's asking us, what is the mass of this two together before the reaction, and what's the mass of this two after the reaction? Let's take a look. Let's take a look at the passage. What is the cofactor they're talking about? What, what is TPMT? TPMT is a methyl transferase. And so, as the name implies, what actually happens with TPMT, it's going to be transferring a methyl group onto this substrate, okay? And you might be thinking, where is this methyl group coming from? Is it just, you know, making out of thin air? Um, no, it's actually going to be from this right here, S-adenosyl methionine. This is the cofactor. This is what's supplying the methyl group onto the, methyl, uh, onto the substrate, sorry. And so you don't actually have to know the exact mechanism here, but you do have to see the pattern here that, okay, we're transferring methyl group. Where would this come from? It's going to be coming from the methionine, the S-adenosyl methionine. That's going to be the methyl group that's being um, provided for the substrate. So let's say we have this methyl group right here, methyl group, and we, you know, shift it over and put it onto the substrate. So the methyl group is now over here. Um, without knowing exactly how this reaction works, this is kind of the broad overview. And if you look at this, I'm going to say, wait, hold on a minute. You know, even though we changed the, where the methyl group is, if we take the mass of both of these guys, we're not actually losing or gaining anything. We just move the methyl group from the cofactor onto the substrate. So what that tells us, the mass doesn't change at all, right? Because you're not losing, you're not gaining anything. All you're doing is shifting things around. Therefore, the mass change is going to be zero grams per mole.